Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, City of San Carlos City Council Successor Agency to the Redevelopment Agency Housing Authority regular meeting of September 10th, 2018. Would you please rise? And uh, leading the Pledge of Allegiance tonight will be the Boy Scout Troop 321. So, gentlemen. Thank you. Are there any changes to the order of agenda this evening? None from staff this evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Malpe. Any phone on the dais or anyone else wishing to change anything around? All right, we'll move on. Item 4A, presentations. First presentation is a city coin to Sergeant Steve Pettit for his years of service. I guess they didn't know how many years of service, Steve, so uh, you want to come up? You can tell us how many years. <laughs> sergeant Pettit has been our administrative sergeant here for how many years? Uh, about three, three and a half years, but has done an awful lot. Uh, and I'm going to let you tell it before I give you the thing about all your experience in law enforcement and other things. Uh, 42 years in law enforcement. I uh, started my career in 77 with the Atherton Police Department. Uh, moved on to the Redwood City Police Department. Um, I left and retired from there when I turned 50. Uh, my wife let me stay home two days. And then I went to work for uh, Sheriff Horsley, the Sheriff's Office. Uh, after uh, 2010, uh, when the City of San Carlos outsourced, um, I was asked to join uh, the ranks with uh, Captain Rothis, Assistant Sheriff Rothis now, um, as a patrol sergeant, and then eventually as the admin sergeant. Great. So. Great time. Well, thank you very much for your service. Um, the coin, if I can open it here, is the city of San Carlos, and it's given uh, basically to folks that contribute to uh, the betterment of San Carlos, and certainly you qualify for that in, in spades. So now you said you retired once, so you're going to retire again? Uh, retire again. Uh -huh. Is your wife here? Uh, no, but I've already been given the word. Yes. Okay. Well, Steve, I don't know what else to say. I mean, you, would you like to say other, something else? No, I, well, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, Captain uh, or Assistant Sheriff Rothis, uh, Captain Dury, and the others with the uh, Sheriff's Office, um, and also the city staff. Uh, we had a lot of uh, interesting conversations, and I, I enjoyed them. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Instead of walking all the way around, I can actually, what a concept, huh? So we have a couple of Eagle Scouts to honor tonight, and this is always a, a great, uh, great pleasure for me to do. Um, these young men uh, do an awful lot of service for the community and uh, all their different projects that they have. So I'm going to call up uh, Nolan Cowart, Cowart and uh, uh, Brett Dubois, if you guys stand up, and I'm going to let you each tell us uh, what school you go to, what year you are, and what project you had. So, Brett, okay. you want to start? Hello, everybody. My name is Brett Dubois from Troop 321 San Carlos, and I go to Design Tech High School in Redwood Shores. Uh, I'm a senior there currently, and for my project, I built 20 bluebird houses for Edgewood Park, and we replaced about, I think, eight of them, and several of them were moved around and relocated to better locations on the trail. Uh, to avoid people messing with them and um, to put them in more ideal locations for the birds. And, uh, yeah. That's great. Thank you, Nolan. You want to tell us what you did and where you're from? Thank you. I'm, uh, my name is Nolan Coet. I'm currently a junior at Sequoia High School. So for my project, we, um, we put in landscaping at the Burton Park at the corner of Cedar and Arroyo. And it was, it was a really great project for me. It taught me a lot. Since I did the, uh, I designed the landscaping, and we got to really, we got to take out the weeds and level the ground and put in the plants and put in the mulch. It was a really great experience for me, and I was super happy to be able to give back to the city of San Carlos. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I noticed, by the way, in both projects that you have helpers, which is great. So uh, you do some work, I know, but it's great to have a bunch of folks that are helping you out on this. As I mentioned before, uh, these young men, uh, it, 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 it is quite a, an achievement to be an Eagle Scout. It takes a lot of work. How many merit badges is it now? There's like 
25? Uh, there are 13 required, or 12 required merit badges, uh -huh. but I earned a total of 26. That's what I mean. How many did you earn? Um, 36. 36. <laughs> I can only imagine, and each merit badge that you earn doesn't take five minutes, believe me. I remember as a Boy Scout, I didn't get that, I think I got seven or eight. That was about as high as I got. But anyway, I want to congratulate both of you and uh, uh, for all the hard work that you did and also for the great work that, like I said, giving back to the community. So thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is public comment. This is a person's wishing to address the city council on matters not on the posted agenda. I have one card so far. Uh, Brian Jaffe. Mr. Jaffe, how are you? Good, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council and city staff, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Brian Jaffe, and I'm the creator of VOCA. VOCA is a new civic engagement platform that uses text messaging to make it easy for everyday people to share their opinions with local government. We've been doing this in Redwood City for over a year, and this past week we just asked our first question here in San Carlos. VOCA responses are structured kind of like Yelp or Amazon reviews, with one meaning uh, strongly disagree or oppose, and five meaning strongly agree or support. This week VOCA asked San Carlos residents to rate the following statement, City Council should expand the outdoor dining program on Laurel Street to additional locations. <coughs> this, of course, is in response to the study session from your last City Council meeting. In total, 120 San Carlos residents responded, 61 support expanding the outdoor dining program, 40 oppose expanding the program, and the remaining 19 are neutral. And you can see that in the uh, handout that I, it should be making its way to you if you haven't seen it already. After VOCA users vote, they can also see other people's comments and upvote the ones they agree with. I will now read some of the top comments. In support, I like the outdoor dining, uh, but Laurel Street parking is so hard right now, maybe they can wait to expand outdoor dining until after their garages are finished. In opposition, I love the idea of outdoor dining. I have thoroughly enjoyed the outdoor experience at town. That said, parking on and near Laurel is horrendous. I can't support more outdoor dining without parking being expanded as well. In closing, VOCA will be asking a new question about a San Carlos issue each week going forward. Participation is free, easy, and anonymous, and you can sign up at our website, which is voca.vote, that's V-O-C-A dot V-O-T-E. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jaffe. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on any item not on the posted agenda this evening? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, next item is consent calendar. Consent calendar items are usually uh, uh, enacted by one motion unless someone w wishes to uh, remove an item from the consent calendar. So, gentlemen. Mr. Mayor, I'll move approval of the consent calendar. I second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grimacott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Um, I am voting yes, except on item 6E, on which I'd like you to record a no vote. Okay. And Mayor Grisilli? Yes. All right. Thank you. Item 7, public hearing. Uh, consideration of adopting three resolutions for the Winding Way project. Number one, adopting the addendum to the final focused environmental impact report. Number two, approving the master development plan, protected tree removal permit and lot line adjustment. Number three, summarily vacating the public right of way. Good evening, honorable mayor, members of the city council. The Winding Way project is perhaps one of the most rigorously evaluated and analyzed projects in the last 20 years. And tonight would be the final step in the city council review of this project. Uh, the city council reviewed it previously when it was annexed to the city. And um, the last, the real last step would be with the planning commission as they would review the design of the homes later in the process. Um, tonight to present you with the details of the project and to answer questions is Jeff Ballantyne, our 
consulting planner, so he'll walk you through the, the project and the planning commission recommendation, and then I will be available, as will Lisa Porras, our principal planner, and Jeff, to answer questions. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Seve. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Ballantyne. I've been a contract planner with the city for the last year and a half so working on this project. Uh, so yeah, it's the Winding Way Master Development Plan. Uh, so ultimately, the applicant would like to develop five single family houses, uh, houses on five lots, along with doing roadway improvements on a currently unimproved portion of Winding Way. So the actions before you tonight are to approve the CEQA addendum, master development plan, a lot line adjustment, a tree removal permit, as well as a right-of-way abandonment. Here's just to give you a little context of where the project's located in the larger city. And here's uh, more up close. You see here the project site in red. Uh, you see two prongs essentially on the top. Uh, one of those is uh, connecting to Chesham Avenue and the other is to Upper uh, Winding Way. Uh, here for existing conditions, the site has a lot of topography and a lot of slope to it. And you get a little sense of that here. And here's a photo of uh, the existing unimproved uh, dirt roadway that is winding way. So th uh, this project has a lot of history to it. Uh, back in March of 2004, uh, the city council of city San of San Carlos approved pre-zoning, essentially pre-zoning the site to low density residential. And that was to start the process for annexing the project site into the city limits. Uh, right after that, a mitigated negative declaration was adopted, and soon after that, the uh, Devonshire Canyon Open Space Alliance uh, sued the document, and then uh, ultimately a settlement agreement was reached between the city and the applicant and this alliance. A number of things came out of that agreement, uh, one of them being that the city needed to prepare a final focus environmental impact report, specifically to uh, evaluate impacts to Dusky Foot of Wood Rat and the Bushmallow plant. And there are also other conditions placed on the project as a result of this agreement, including a reduced roadway to 18 feet, a pedestrian path, as well as an access gate restricting access uh, to essentially the uh, residents uh, up in Upper Winding Way. And then a uh, number of years passed, and in 2009, the final focused EIR uh, was indeed adopted by the city, and the site was annexed into the city limits. And then just in the last few months, uh, the project's been before two planning commission meetings. So the master development plan, this was a requirement placed on the project as part of the uh, annexation approvals. And essentially what this is, does is basically show where the lot lines are, uh, where the right of way is and the proposed roadway, uh, where the creek is and the creek setbacks, and basically just showing footprints of where houses could be located. Uh, at a later date, the applicant will need to get design review approval of each house by planning commission. And here you see uh, four houses uh, on the upper portion, and this, it slopes downward as you go uh, up, and then the creek is where you see those trees. Uh, so one of the other ent entitlements for tonight is a lot line adjustment. And this is to meet the requirement of the annexation approvals that each lot be a minimum of 20,000 square feet. And so this would not be creating any new lots, it would just be adjusting lot lines between four parcels. As well as a right-of-way abandonment. Uh, so the city currently owns an easement over the 50-foot right-of-way of Winding Way. And so this is proposing, you see those three portions uh, in hash marks uh, to be abandoned to each of the individual parcels. And again, the purpose there is to help each parcel achieve 20,000 square feet. Uh, another entitlement is protected tree removal permit. Uh, this is tree impacts specifically related to the proposed roadway. Uh, of the 20 trees proposed for removal, 10 are uh, protected trees and they're coast live oaks. And so as uh, one of the conditions of approval on the project is that the applicant would need to provide 10 replacement trees. 
So, uh, neighbor concerns. So, we received a lot of feedback from a number of different neighbors on a lot of different aspects of the project. Uh, first of which was the dirt hall route. Uh, back in July uh, 16, Planning Commission reviews the, reviewed the first proposal for the dirt hall route. And we received a lot of feedback, a lot of concerns from the neighbors. Um, I'll delve into that more in the following slides. And then uh, during the Planning Commission meeting in July, uh, one of the concerns was construction and dirt hauling hours. And so condition 14 restricts construction uh, between Monday and Friday and does not allow work on the weekends. And then condition 15 restricts dirt hauling from uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then finally, uh, parking on Chesham, that was raised as a concern by a number of uh, a uh, couple of the neighbors. And so condition 16 requires that uh, no parking of construction vehicles occur on the paved portion of Chesham Avenue. So here's the originally proposed dirt hall route. Uh, you see it, it goes towards the southeast. Uh, you see the site with the red star and then it goes up Chesham down to uh, Windsor and then takes a ride on Torino. And that's really the problematic churn right there. Uh, a house right at that uh, dead end has actually been hit a couple times. And so that was one of the major concerns as well as it utilizes a pretty substantial portion of county roads. And so this was the revised dirt hall route that came before Planning Commission on August 20th last month, uh, which they ultimately approved. And it goes more towards the Northeast, uh, taking left on Windsor from Chesham and uh, then eventually getting up to San Carlos Avenue. And then in terms of long-term neighbor concerns that we received, uh, one of them was the access gate that I mentioned from settlement agreement. Uh, so during the planning commission meeting in July, uh, they directed staff to work with the uh, city attorney as well as with the uh, fire marshal to explore if there's options to allow emergency access for those neighbors up an upper, upper winding way uh, to be able to get through that gate uh, in case of emergencies such as a fire. Uh, however, in talking with the fire marshal and with the city attorney, um, one, the fire marshal mentioned uh, concern in terms of not having emergency personnel be available to go open that gate for the obvious reasons that they'll be busy uh, with an emergency. And then uh, the city attorney mentioned uh, concern with uh, allowing access to, to neighbors because essentially that'd be in conflict with the settlement agreement. And, and he can provide more information on that if you'd like. Uh, the next concern was uh, creek crossing. One neighbor asked about you know, looking to do a bridge instead of a culvert at the major creek crossing. Uh, however, what the applicant proposing is essentially replacing an existing culvert that is uh, dilapidated and no longer functioning. So they're replacing like for like, and they've already gone through a significant amount of review with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Department of uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board, as well as with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, to really look at this proposal very carefully to uh, minimize any impacts of the creek. And then uh, next concern, retaining wall heights and safety. Uh, so a number of neighbors were concerned with in terms of the retaining wall along the roadway in terms of its overall bulk and height. And so their attachment 10 in your packet shows uh, what the retaining wall would look like and what the proposed heights are. And then with the safety, uh, Planning Commission placed condition 11 on the project uh, requiring that uh, additional safety fencing be placed on the upsloping portions of the retaining wall. Uh, with the concern that if a child or somebody were to fall off the retaining wall, it, um, it would be dangerous. And then uh, driveway access, one neighbor was concerned that the proposed roadway was going to impede their driveway access. And so the applicant has since revised their proposed roadway and has met with the uh, neighbor and neighbors indicated that the, the revised proposal is, uh, is acceptable to them. And then just the last two uh, was really just beefing up uh, indication that the project needs to comply with the FFEIR, as well as including verbatim the mitigation measures. And then street lighting, one neighbor indicated concern in terms of uh, having too much street lighting. And my understanding is that uh, the applicant's not required to provide it, nor do they intend to provide street lighting. And they can correct me if I was wrong on that one. On the environmental review, I've already mentioned M&D was adopted in 2004, the FFEIR in 2009. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is the FFEIR really only included an updated biological resources chapter and then incorporated by reference all of the other chapters in the M&D. 
since those were not challenged. And then an addendum was prepared recently with the reason that the FFEIR and the MMD had been adopted so many years ago. And what that addendum essentially found was that no substantial changes occurred to the project or to circumstances, uh, and no new information was available to indicate that any of the items in the checklist for CEQA uh, resulted in a substantial environmental impact that had not already been addressed in the FFEIR. I already mentioned the involvement of the top three agencies. I also want to mention uh, County of San Mateo is involved because one segment of the roadway that connects to the upper portion of Winding Way is in the county's jurisdiction, and so we will definitely need their approval before Public Works uh, can ultimately approve the street improvement plans. And just uh, on this one, this just shows you uh, mitigation areas as directed by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Uh, the area in purple is the riparian area to be protected, and the area is shown in A, B, uh, D, and C are uh, mitigation areas where the applicant will actually need to provide new plantings to really actually improve uh, the plantings in the creek area and to mitigate impacts to the, the dusky foot of wood rat and the bush mallow plant. So in, in summary, for the Planning Commission actions, you know, they provide recommendations that City Council uh, adopt this CEQA addendum, as well as the Master Development Plan, the line adjustment of the protected tree removal permit. And they also made the following final actions uh, subject to Council approval of the Master Development Plan, and that was the road abandonment general plan consistency finding, as well as the master grading plan and the grading and dirt hall certificate. Um, so with that, this is a, a summary of uh, actions before the council. I'm available for questions and also want to note that the applicant is here tonight and has also prepared a presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, Mr. Olbert? Thank you, Bob. Thank you for the presentation. Um, let's see. Um, the uh, abandonment of the right-of-way entitlements, um, I'm not I, I know we've acted on a few of those since I've been on the council, but I'm not that familiar with them. Um, w what does the community get for abandoning the right-of-ways? I don't believe there's uh, necessarily there's something that they're offering. I think the idea here is that there's 50 foot of right-of-way, and the applicant only needs a portion of that uh, for the actual roadway. Um, okay, because the road itself is not going to be as large as the right-of-way, unlike in other parts of, of, of other parts of the community. Um, maybe if you don't mind, my question maybe is, is if I can direct to Jeff, do we, is that um, not uncommon that we um, abandon right-of-ways? It, it's not uncommon in the situation of new developments like this, yeah. Just we haven't seen too many new developments lately. That's right. correct. We don't get a lot of subdivisions anymore. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, condition 16, which was the no parking on Chesham Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall when that was added? Was that added during the, the Planning Commission uh, study or? Correct, that, that was added. I believe it was in the August meeting and that was because a number of neighbors re did uh, express concern that they did not want any. The reason I was asking is just because I think we all received an email today from somebody who was concerned about parking. Um, and um, uh, it sounds like that had already been addressed. Which is, I mean, it's fine for somebody to object to it or be concerned about it. I just wanted to make sure it's the same issue. I, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, the dirt hauling with the revised route, uh, can you remind me again what hours the dirt hauling can take place? Sure. So that is 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and that's specifically for trucks with more than nine wheels, so for the large dirt hauling trucks. Okay. That's... Probably, I mean, I'm just San Carlos Avenue is pretty busy even at the beginning and ends of that time, but, but hopefully um, that won't be too bad. Um, and then I think my last question is a Greg Rubin's question. The, uh, uh, I, I thought it was interesting with the description of the issue about possibly relocating the gate or making the gate more openable. Um, does, does a legal settlement such as was entered into, does that create any kind of safe harbor if there's a problem that develops during an emergency because equipment can't get through or people can't get out or, because I, I know part of the argument for not being able to make a tweak to it was because of the existence of the settlement agreement. So does it work the other way too? Well, I, you know, I, that's, 
it's an interesting hypothetical you're asking me, and and I think the uh, it the settlement agreement is kind of the baseline of what the city's already previously agreed to. So to the extent that the city agreed to that 10 years ago, uh, and we're constrained from um, taking a different course of action, I think that does offer some uh, liability protection in that uh, in some sort of hypothetical claim like that. Okay, uh, let's all hope that we never have to test that, but um, okay. I think that was it for questions. Thank you. Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a couple. Um, can you bring that map up uh, that shows uh, the outline of the project, the one with the red outline? I'm just a little confused as to where in that outline this project is. Uh, you just have an arrow that points to project site, but is, oh, I see. Is that that little where it says winding way there? Is that, that's the area there? Yeah, so the reason you see those two prongs on the, the top, mm -hmm. those are the, the roadway connecting to existing paved portions of Chesham and paved portions of Winding Way. And then the big bulk of it is where you have uh, four parcels uh, within sort of that Winding Way that curves around it, and then you have one other parcel on the outer edge. And it helps, I think, if I pull up. You can cut, this is if you flip it upside down. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna be creating a road is that right? So it, it currently it's, it's unpaved dirt roadway. Um, and it's, is, it, is it the width that it will be? Or will it need to be widened? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. I think at one point it was drivable, but over the years it's really eroded. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of its exact width, I think it, it varies. Okay. All right, and then I only had one other question. I know you said there's gonna take out 20 trees and they're gonna replant some. Is there a, a plan for the type of trees? Are they gonna be, I assume they'll be native? Right, so that'll be, uh, I believe, up to um, planning commission to determine when they when they come back for design review approval of what their proposal is. Um, so that'll be up to planning commission to review and approve of those. Okay. All right. Yeah, no current plans. Okay. Um, that's all I have for the moment. Okay. Mr. Grocott. So the question I have regards um, the condition 16. Um, couple of questions we so we received some correspondence from neighbors that are concerned about the parking and it seems as though they're still concerned about parking on Chesham on the curve of the street um, it says in here no, that the developers agreed not to park on any paved portion of Chesham, Chesham so I, I assume that language would mean that the curved portion cannot be parked on is that correct so yeah it's my understanding um, there's unpaved portions that are actually on their property, and I believe you know we can't really restrict them from not parking on their own property. Right. Um, so I believe that's what that condition does: is essentially you can't park on the city's right of way of Chesham, but you can park on your own property. Okay. And then uh, just a follow-up question on that: if we were to do anything to Condition 16 uh, to include language that might say something like including the you know, curve portion, the last curve portion before entering the site. Uh, a, is that, would that upset the apple cart for what's on the dais tonight if we did that? And B, um, because we've got so many things that we're taking action on for this one project, where does that fit in? Where would we put that in? Yeah, so I believe if you would want to make that change, it would be to that condition 16 for that resolution. Yeah, but what, oh, so, I'm sorry, I didn't bring my glasses tonight and I'm having a little trouble putting things together here. So just which which action tonight would include uh, condition 16? So that's in the resolution for the master, de there's a three three entitlements in the one resolution. It includes the master development plan, uh, the tree removal permit and the lot line adjustment. Mm -hmm. It's the second resolution in Se the packet. Second reso in the packet. Okay, just so I know where I am and when to do that if we're gonna do that at all. So, okay, thanks very much. What's your name again? Uh, Jeff Valentine. Jeff, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just through the chair, um, just some uh, helpful thought on that condition 16 in light of uh, Councilmember Grocott's um, concerns. Um, we could say, um, during road construction activities, construction vehicles and equipment will not be allowed to be parked or stored on or along the paved area, or paved portion of Chesham. 
Now it just says on the paved portion. I think that might be some of the confusion that's there. Because if you say literally on, well, they're not even allowed to park on, but that, that sounds like, I think the intention, and I was at that meeting, the intention was along Chesum. Sorry, uh, so what you're, the clarifier, clarification you're making is anywhere there's pavement, even alongside the road, yeah. no parking. That's right. Yeah, got it, yes. okay. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Um, so public safety is uh, passed on all this. In other words, the fire department can get their vehicles up there and whatever. Yes, this has been through multiple rounds of review, I think four or five rounds. And uh, yes, it, uh, one of the conditions is placed is that the, there's an 18-foot roadway as well as a three-foot pedestrian path, and that pedestrian path needs to support uh, fire. And they've been through multiple iterations to make sure the slope is appropriate okay. and the turning radius as well. Okay. And the uh, fire marshals here. Okay, as, well. as long as they approve it. Um, now, when you put, you said gates, is there gonna be one gate, two gates? How does, where are the gates gonna be? If you could go back to the, maybe even to the one Ron was talking about, the red, where are the gates gonna be? Or are there more gate, one gate, two gates? What are there? Oops, there are buttons. Okay, so basically then the only people that will be able to get through there are the people who own the property, the five f homeowners? Yeah, the, yeah, the idea being that all the, the neighbors on the upper portion of the right are not be able to. Okay, so, but there's no gate at Chesham? There is currently, I believe there is a gate, but that will be removed. So if I'm driving on Chesham, I can now drive into this property? Correct. And go all the way around and then I get stuck when I get, try to get out? I'd have to make a U-turn or something to come around. I'm just, I'm just asking, in other words, so it's gonna be a public roadway? Uh, I believe it'll be uh, privately owned and maintained. Yeah. It's, it's actually, um, uh, my recollection is that it's, it's a public roadway, and that's one of the items, that's why we're abandoning part of it. Okay. But um, it's gonna, there's gonna be a requirement that it be maintained by the, the Property owners. Okay, I understand that, but I'm just saying if Joe Smith wants to take a ride someday, he can come up Chesham, go all the way through all those five houses, and then stop and get stuck at the gate. He can't get out, and he'll have to just make a U turn and come back. And you will have to, they'll have to maneuver their vehicle and, and turn around. And drive up there. People so, will be able to drive. So I'm missing the there. point of why having, why, why is there a gate then? Well, this is a, <laughs> this, well, first of all, that was again another condition of the settlement agreement okay. that there be a gate there, and that, and, because okay, I've been around long enough. I, know, I remember. I, have too, but I, I can't remember. <laughs> so the reason for the gate there is um, it was originally, it's a kind of a, 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 the gate right now is in disrepair, but the, the new gate is to allow fire access, and the fire marshal can probably speak to this, but I'm going to summarize that the gate enables the development to be a through road for fire protection purposes so that so a turnaround is not required there because the fire department has access. Under the settlement agreement, the public and the plaintiffs in that case were concerned that, that this would become a through road. Um, primarily um, the, the people who live along Winding Way might perceive that the shorter way to leave the neighborhood would so be to go through this eliminate area. Eliminate a shortcut. Yes. Okay, for, in English, eliminate a shortcut. Yes. Okay, that's fine. I just want to, I couldn't remember, because it seems odd to have a gate, but that you can go in the other way. Okay. Um, the dirt hall hours are nine to four. What are the construction hours? Uh, shoot, I need to... I need to pull that up. That, I believe standard. No, please tell me what they are. Standard city protocol. I, I would just need to pull that up in my packet. Okay, go ahead yeah. and get it. All right. I got. I have time. Because they're not going to haul dirt on the weekends, but they certainly might be able to construct. So. Mr. Grove, do you know? Right, but, I, but sometimes weekends are allowed, so that's what I'm asking. Weekends are, were eliminated from okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's eight to five construction Monday through Friday. So yeah, the, the specific hours aren't in here because it defaults to whatever's in the that's municipal fine. code. As long as I'm just trying to identify if there's some adjustment or whatever. So yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, and uh, on the dirt hall, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Grove because um, you may know uh, how many how many trips. 20, 20 round trips. 20? 
Yes. That's all? That's all. What the intent there is all of the uh, grading will actually be utilized for okay, so infill. So this is really just mostly debris and, okay, and such. Okay, so 20 trips, and how many uh, uh, trips a day estimated? Uh, what they estimate, one every two one weeks? 1.5 trips a week. 1.5 trips a week. So we'll, it'll take, okay, all right, okay. So it'll take a long time, but the, the impact to the roads is gonna be very minimal because you're only gonna have one and a half a week. So maybe once, one day or two days a week, there might be trucks. Correct. Okay, yeah. just trying to identify that. All right, um, this is a public hearing and I have uh, speaker cards, so I will call folks up. Thank you for your presentation. There may be some other questions. Uh, sure, Mr. Grove, did you want to say anything? I didn't mean to cut you out of it. Did you want to have any? Okay, if you could identify yourself. <laughs> Don't ask me, <laughs> ask him. <laughs> yeah, I'm consistent. See, there's other people. Could you identify yourself, sir? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Hi. Council, and staff. Uh, my name is Michael Chilcote. My partner, Ronald Grove, and I are the sole owners of this canyon and the project in front of you this evening. And thanks. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, a little bit of this will be repetitive, but hopefully the points will be underscored. Uh, as mentioned by Jeff, the site, of course, has an existing unusable gravel road and a non-functional drainage system. The drainage system was designed to prevent erosion of the road and canyon, but unfortunately it was constructed with wood and corrugated metal pipe, which is not a design for longevity. And coupled with that, it has also been unmaintained for years. Therefore, the drainage system was rendered non-functional for approximately a decade or so. The result of this, uh, caused a road and canyon to suffer erosion in multiple locations and an extreme washout location. Winter rains become sediment flows into downstream waterways. Stormwater and debris flows across the intersection of Chesham and Winding Way during heavy rains. It is currently a dangerous condition due to the buildup of overgrown and dead vegetated material. There is no fire department or no emergency vehicle access in this canyon. Therefore, a fire in this canyon could be unfortunately catastrophic. There have also been recent graffiti incidences. And perhaps the most important, if left unimproved, this canyon and gravel road will erode further. This project in front of you this evening uh, remedies all the foregoing and improves life safety conditions in the San Carlos Hills. So I have a few photos of the site. This photo shows the extent of the washout, which has exponentially worsened since the drainage system failed a decade or so ago. This clearly shows difficulty of access and frankly, a dangerous condition for pedestrians. This image shows the corrugated metal pipe that is clearly rusted, broken, and non-functional. Here we show the unfortunate recent graffiti situation in the canyon. We are aware of several neighbors phoning into the city voicing their displeasure of this. But this project proposal transforms this image into this image. Here we show an artist rendering of the same road section. We have incorporated the retaining wall material requested by planning staff, which is an earth tone split faced block material. We would submit to council that this is quite an improvement from the previous image and we feel is aesthetically appealing as well. Prior to gaining the privilege to be in front of council this evening, the project team can assure the council that we have worked long and hard with all these government agencies and departments listed on this slide. And it is these agencies that have specified, in fact, in some cases dictated, several of the details of the project in front of council this evening. And those agencies, as, as Jeff mentioned, we have two from the state, Fish and Wildlife, which granted an original approval, and then a recent reinspection and extension of that approval, which was dated March 23rd of this year. The Regional Water Quality Control Board, of course, also approved the project. 
From the federal level, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers also granted an original approval and then a recent reinspection and extension of that approval, which was December of last year. And at the local level, of course, we work with your public works department, your planning department, and the fire department. Having said the foregoing, we have had two neighbor outreach meetings in the past year and two very recent public hearings with the Planning Commission. We did listen to the comments made in these forums and wish to be receptive to the input received from the Open Space Alliance and the rest of the neighbors. Hence, we have made the following revisions to the project based on input from the community. And we just touched on some of this, so I'll be brief. Construction, again, will be limited to the weekdays. We changed the haul route based on safety concerns and past history of accidents. Large trucks are limited to the haul route from the hours of nine to four. And we self-instituted a traffic management plan, which says there will be no parking on city streets by employees, subcontractors, or delivery vehicles, all parking to be accommodated on the job site. Limited occasional parking at the lower entrance of the project just off Chesham, however, will be permitted. Again, that's limited and occasional. There will be no turning around of trucks on city streets. A turnaround area currently exists on the job site. There will be no need to inconvenience the current residents by stopping vehicular traffic or pedestrians on city streets. And finally, we are imposing a 15 mile an hour speed limit on all trucks above nine wheels utilizing the Planning Commission approved haul route. Likewise, staff and the fire department have made requests that we have complied with. Public Works requested a vehicle protective guardrail be installed on the lower side of the road, which we agree to. Planning suggested the earth tone split face block material for the retaining walls above the road, which we agreed to and you saw a rendering of. And fire department made two requests. They requested that the pedestrian path adjacent to the road be engineered to support the weight of the fire truck. And also they requested a fuel reduction and maintenance plan to quote, reduce the danger to, to the future structures that will be built in the future and existing neighbors from a wildfire. Now, not every suggestion from the neighborhood at large were we able to implement. Three of those suggestions or concerns are noted here, and we wish to preemptively have a response to these items should one or more be raised this evening in front of council. Firstly, I would like to reemphasize that this project proposal strictly adheres to both the terms of the suit settlement agreement and the specifications set forth by the federal agencies, the state agencies, and your local agencies. So it has recently been suggested that we build a bridge to span the current top of banks. And our answer, the approving federal and state agencies unanimously want the canyon restored. Specifically, the Fish and Wildlife Original Agreement and the extension this last March, section three titled Riparian Restoration states, and I quote, permittees shall restore the area that has eroded upstream of the culvert. This project complies with this clause in the Fish and Wildlife Agreement, and with your approval, the project team will restore this canyon as instructed. There were also a couple concerns raised by neighbors and the Open Space Alliance. Concern number one is this project will damage the riparian corridor by filling it with concrete. Our answer to that is again, in the Fish and Wildlife Original Agreement and Extension, that agreement states, and I quote, future housing construction requires a 25 foot creek setback line where no construction activity can occur. So obviously it's, if that's the case, there will be no concrete in the riparian corridor. And their second concern, this project is in violation of the environmental impact report, sensitive species requirements. I believe HD Harvey uh, and Associates is our ecological consulting firm. They are here this evening to talk about that just for a minute or two, but we have retained them to ensure that we are going to be compliant with the FEIR. In summary, the project team would like to state the benefits of this project for both city and community. 
This new road, pedestrian path, and drainage system will improve life safety conditions in the Devonshire Canyon. Currently, a fire in this canyon would have unimpeded access to ridge lines and neighboring homes. This road, this new road, would provide much needed ingress and egress locations for firefighters and emergency vehicles in the hills of San Carlos. This project will further stabilize the canyon from further erosion. It is engineered for longevity with a concrete drainage headwall and high grade plastic piping. This stormwater collection system, as mentioned, will also need to be maintained by the, by the new owners of the homes, as well as the road. This project will eliminate sediment flows into downstream waterways. It will eliminate stormwater flows across the intersections of Chesham and Winding Way. And it will facilitate safe, and we think wonderful walking access for the new owners, all the neighbors, and the community at large. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, is Harvey and Associates here? Oh, excellent, okay. So having said that, I would just like to introduce them, please, to give you guys a brief status of the ecological situation in the canyon. Good evening, uh, I'm Dr. Dave Johnston. I'm an ecological consultant with H.T. Harvey and Associates. Our headquarters is in Los Gatos, California, and that is also where my office is. Um, I was first introduced to this project about maybe 12 years ago, and I met with the Department of Fish and Game uh, staff there on the project site. Uh, yes. Uh, how long is your presentation? Uh, no more than three minutes. Fine, thank you. Um, and uh, Fish and Game, um, as the FEIR, um, also stated that two issues were uh, the ac accurate bush mallow and also the San Francisco dusky footed wood rat. There had been a surveys earlier, um, previous um, consultant. We redid those about 12 years ago and found 58 uh, wood rat nests. We found two uh, bush mallow plants. We recently have redone both surveys, we found no um, bush mallow um, plants, and this is by uh, expert botanists. I did not do those surveys. And um, apparently those plants live 10 years or less, and they think possibly because of the extreme drought conditions, um, the two plants or two or three plants that were there previously may not have survived. Um, there are more wood rats today than there were in order to build a road. Um, we've identified a couple of dozen wood rat nests that will have to be um, moved or translocated. We've had excellent success doing this uh, for the state of California, for many agencies, including the Santa Clara Valley Water District um, and, and several government entities on the peninsula here including Caltrans. So um, those, are, those were the two uh, conditions and, and concerns of the fish and game, and you know, we are monitoring them and addressing them. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Johnson. Thank you. Questions for these gentlemen, Mr. Grocott? I have a question for the guy who just, uh, the gentleman who just sat down. Who asked the question? Over here on the dais. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'm just curious on the dusky footed wood rat, how much need there is for protection of these because, you know, just from my own experience, every time I go hiking anywhere in San Carlos, be it uh, big, you know, the canyon off of Britain or Edgewood Park or anywhere, I always see these nests. Uh, so it appears to me that these things are not that endangered. I'm just a hiker. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, 
it, 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 it's complicated and, and yet it's not. But the short story is it's because of a unique population called the San Francisco dusky-footed wood rat. The genetics presumably were only on this peninsula. However, uh, uh, Marjorie Maddock, who's a geneticist, looked at all of these uh, dusky-footed wood rats and found that this genetic uh, type is actually a, the same as it is in the inner coast range all the way down to Bakersfield and, and on up into the Sierra. And therefore, she considers this uh, the same subspecies as a much larger, what we call a clade. Uh, I have since actually recommended to uh, Fish and Game in their uh, uh, mammal species of special concern that they don't include the San Francisco dusky-footed rat, wood rat, based on uh, Dr. Maddox's work, uh, which was a good five years ago. And um, nonetheless, um, Fish and Game is, I think, three years late in publishing their newest species of special concern. So it remains as a species of special concern, but when they come out with that document, it will likely have been removed. Thank you. That's the inside story. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. More than I need it, but I just had one quick question. Uh, if this is approved, all these things are approved tonight, when are you going to start grading or moving dirt? Whatever. Could you come up? To, I apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, my name's Ron Gerard. Sure. Um, whenever we get permission, we can so, start as soon as we get our permits. So and I think we've gone through extensive plans. Is, isn't there a deadline of like October 15th or something and you can't move dirt after that? Or? I'm not real positive on the on Okay, the well, I can find there. out from staff. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Go. So what's the answer to that question? Grace or? Thanks, Grace. A grading moratorium from October 1st to, um, okay. yeah, to All right. May. So basically, if they can't get the permits before October 1st, then they're stuck till April or March? Um, end of April. End of May April. 1st. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a public hearing, and I have some speaker cards. Uh, Brad Freeman. Try to limit the comments to about two or three minutes if you can. Thank you. I, um, I live on 203 Chesham right at the gate where the project begins. I'm gonna kind of repeat what was just said, but I'd like to provide a few points that highlight why we are in favor of the project. It will make the canyon safer for all the residents in the area. It will re remove the unsightly graffiti and provide less of an environment to attract further graffiti. It's been getting worse lately. It will fix existing drainage and erosion issues on, of the creek. It will provide a per permanent hiking trail for the canyon. It will provide additional housing in a responsible manner that fits the character of the neighborhood. All of this will be done at no cost to the residents of San Carlos, plus guarantee new revenues to the city going forward. That's it. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, John McIntosh. Welcome. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council and staff. Uh, I'm a, I am a homeowner in Devonshire Canyon and um, Thus, the name Canyon implies slope, as, as you know, and as I think the planner mentioned. And when there's slope, there's water, and my concern has to do with water. Um, though I'm sure that these plans have been ex exceptionally rigorous and analyzed to the nth degree, um, it has been my experience that sometimes water will find a way. And uh, so my, I'm not really for or against this project or this sp specific development, but I do have a hypothetical question or concern, and, and it goes like this. If it's proven that this development uh, does divert water unintendedly or inconsequentially to another property or to another space and causes damage, which party would be responsible, let's say, in a year or two if that damage were to occur, again, as a result of the development? Would it be the developer, the current homeowner, the city, um, the person who was, who, the person whose property was damaged. So that's, that's my question. 
All right, thank you for your comment. Mr. Rubens, do you want to uh, answer that or have any idea? It's really, it depends, I think, is what you're going to say. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I think the, um, the basic, this is a, I, I, obviously, it was, as was stated, this is a, a project that's been in the plans for a long time. It's re been reviewed by um, the city departments in the state. What, um, what is um, the public improvements to deal with drainage on the site have all been reviewed by the city engineer and the city departments. The, the, the approvals require maintenance of, of these items by the, the property owners. There's going to be a, a, a homeowners association of these five homes. Um, so to the extent that this project contributes to a problem, it'll be dealt with by the, by the homeowners. Um, to the extent that at so, in some way that the city is somehow contributed to this. I've seen cases where the city is named as a potential defendant, but the agreements are designed to put the responsibility on the homeowners. Okay, thank you for your comments. Next speaker is David Feder. Feder. Sorry if I missed that. That's enough, thanks, evening. My name is David Fedor, um, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, staff. Uh, I live at 420 Winding Way. That's right at the top of the current Upper Winding Way terminus. Um, at the location of the uh, proposed uh, gate uh, to be locked. Um, I want to thank staff for you know, working with me over the past few months on this issue. Uh, we talked about the public health and safety concerns we have with a locked manual gate uh, blocking the roadway. Um, tonight, I just want to reiterate uh, my opposition to the existence of this gate blocking Winding Way. Winding Way was dedicated in 1924 as a public right-of-way, as a straight loop that map as laid out today has been on everyone's property deeds for nearly 100 years showing the intent to complete that loop and for that reason winding way has been developed without any sort of turnaround capabilities at all except maybe uh, you know a few neighbors driveways it's a very winding and narrow road as the name suggests um, i believe that putting this gate on the road is in violation of san carlos general plan guidelines which encourage the interconnectedness of city streets uh, San Carlos General Plan further goes on to suggest that traffic mitigation measures can include traffic calming devices such as speed bumps and road hubs and chicanes. It does not mention gates. Uh, San Carlos Municipal Code, uh, as mentioned by Mr. Rubens, uh, states that it does not permit uh, dead end streets um, and requires a turnaround capability. Uh, which has been interpreted here to refer only to fire apparatus, um, though I don't see a state as such in the municipal code. So it's my belief that this goes against uh, city city uh, guidelines and and code. Um, I want to thank the you know the comments from the fire marshal at the planning commission, and I, think I believe he's here tonight regarding his concerns on the health and safety of having the gate across this road that would prevent vehicular access and namely in the event of a large um, fire, wildfire, or other regional uh, conflagration in the canyon, such as an earthquake. Uh, this isn't a hypothetical scenario. Uh, USGS uh, estimates a one-third chance with magnitude 6.7 earthquake on the Hayward Fault in the next 25 years, similar chances on the San Andreas Fault, so it's actually better than expected odds to occur. And when that occurs, USGS expects over 400 fires to be set through broken gas lines and down electricity lines throughout the region and no access to water. In the Santa Rosa fires, the fire was recorded at traveling at 50 miles an hour up canyon walls. Uh, and the fire marshal stated that he would likely be unable to open this gate for vehicular access uh, in the case of such an emergency. Winding Way only has one other access. It has been blocked on numerous occasions in the past through down trees, landslides. It happened when this haul truck hit the house of Bono Torino. And my wife and I had to hike into our house from the back of the canyon. Um, I appreciate the efforts to mitigate the health and safety aspects of that gate. However, the best mitigation would be to not have a gate in the first place. Uh, there's been reference to the settlement agreement that was signed in 2004, so it's a long time ago. I believe the settlement agreement is faulty. Uh, it was negotiated, it's not a court order, it was a voluntary legal agreement the city entered into with the developer and a subset of residents in the area. Namely, residents from Upper Winding Way were not consulted and were not party to that settlement. Um, and so that's how it resulted in a decision to block them from using the road through the gate. I'm not familiar with another case. Are in you which just about through? Because you've already run way over. 
Thanks. I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. Um, I, I'm not familiar with another case in which a third party has been asked to mitigate uh, for traffic impacts. You know, we are not causing traffic impacts. The traffic impacts are from the new development, and a third party is being obligated in order to uh, to, to deal with that without any traffic studies having been done or turnaround studies of the essence of the gate. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. The next speaker I have is Diane. I live at 123 Chesham Avenue, and I'm the one who wrote the email you received. Um, I didn't receive a notice of this hearing or this being on the agenda, so I wasn't aware of it until Friday. And when I looked, I didn't see condition 16. Uh, Jeff was kind enough to send me a pointer today, so I went for the safer way, which was to let you all know about the concerns. The, the language in uh, condition 16 is very different from what I saw at the Planning Commission. So if I could ask two questions, it seems to me there's a conflict. Condition 16 is very clear that there'll be no parking on paved space. And um, I believe you're saying that there will be- Ma'am, please talk to us. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I believe they're saying that there will be occasional parking at the entrance. I presume that's on paved space because if it's on their property and not on paved space, well, that's fine. I mean, that doesn't create a safety issue. So it seems like there's a conflict. There's a condition 16 saying it won't happen. And then in the presentation, we're hearing that it will happen. And um, I don't know if you've been over there, but um, you know, if you visit that area, I think it's pretty clear what the risk is. My other question was, um, or, or just wanted to comment regarding um, the letter of another person from Chesham Avenue that um, uh, of the issue of putting concrete in the creek in the um, diagram that. Jeff showed, there was a purple riparian area going through the crossover with Winding Way. So it looks like that's where concrete is going to be put and it is going across the creek. And that's why that was addressed in a, a letter. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next speaker is Kate Pfaff, if I said that right. My name is Kate Pfaff, um, and uh, I guess you could say tonight I'm speaking for the trees. I guess I'm a Lorax tonight. Um, I teach the Bugs Garden program at Britton Acres, and over there I teach my students um, to see all of nature as interconnected. So when I hear that 20 trees are coming down, 10 of which are coastal live oaks, I'm concerned. Live oaks are a keystone species. Everything else depends on them. The roots anchor the canyon. They prevent erosion. The leaf litter helps control uh, which invasive plants are able to grow underneath that, that oak tree um, because they have particular allelopathic um, chemicals in them. When we talk about the dusky-footed wood rat, well, there's another nice little critter. Um, I know maybe Maybe it doesn't seem very important. It's just a rat the size of your foot. Um, it doesn't sound very nice, but they're pretty cool species. They live in families and um, they actually have rooms in their houses just like you and I do. They ferment their own food and get drunk off of it. <laughs> they have separate bathrooms and living rooms. And, um, and the reason you see so many in a cluster is that they live in family groups. So the idea of relocating them seems a bit unfair to oust an entire family of related species from their homes. I heard that they're going to mitigate that and plant, uh, plant trees elsewhere, so I, I just wanna speak up and say that I hope that they are native species. I hope they're located nearby. And I hope they really consider the impact that moving keystone species and family groups have on everything else in that canyon and all the ways that they're interconnected in hydrology, chemistry, everything. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this matter tonight? All right, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. 
Second. Moved and seconded to close the public hearing. Roll call, please. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Mayor Grisilli? Yes. All right, uh, Mr. Johnson? Uh, I wanted to ask a question of staff. Um, I, w I was somewhat persuaded by the gentleman's comments about the gate. Um, and so I was wondering if I could get a little bit of history about the settlement agreement and um, what, uh, how, I, I heard the, in the presentation the comment that this was an agreement with neighbors because there was a concern about um, more traffic in a particular section of road. But if you could just give me a little bit of color and also um, what would be entailed in revisiting that particular part of the agreement. I think that's probably a question to me, Councilor sure, Johnson. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the the um, it, it, the lawsuit that was filed against the city um, back in 2003, 2004. One of the claims was uh, that the, in addition to the um, bush mallow and the dusty footed wood rat, was that there was a generalized traffic concern that the 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 plaintiffs in the case pursued saying that the gate was important so that it wouldn't become a through road. But they rec but the settlement agreement recognizes that the gate would have to be available for fire access um, and it, it restricts it to pedestrian only. And I think that was, um, as I recall, let me put it that way, that was to preserve the status quo that existed then. There was a gate that was locked and, and pedestrians walked around the gate even though the gate extends across the whole existing roadway so that pedestrians could continue to walk through that, through the canyon even after the homes are built. Um, the, one of the um, other constraints in the settlement agreement that really hasn't been discussed uh, as much is the roadway width was actually agreed to. And that was also a traffic related issue that was brought up by the plaintiffs in the case. So the roadway width was no more than, uh, than 18 feet which is designed to kind of allow two cars to pass slowly past each other, but not, not because it, had a, it has a 50 foot right of way as it was constructed. So that's actually a very wide roadway that theoretically could have been built. So those two things together were the issues that drove, uh, were, were driving the part of the lawsuit. So the city agreed to, to do these things and have these restrictions. So what you're seeing tonight is this 18 foot wide paved surface and because of fire department requirements, we have the three foot wide path, which is also part of the settlement agreement. And it's compacted to, you know, crushed granite or crushed gravel. It'll be, it'll have the standards to be able to accommodate a fire truck. And then as I said earlier, the gate's necessary so that the fire vehicles, when they're out on patrol, especially in high fire danger times, they have a way to go through and don't have to, with their bigger, larger vehicles have to turn around. Um, they can just go straight through because they have to patrol the whole area anyway. So they want to have access to go through. Um, the, it, the settlement agreement, when I analyze the settlement agreement, and I think this is part of your question, it's pretty explicit that it says pedestrian access only. And if we allowed um, uh, residents to have keys, I, I felt that we would have, there'd be a problem with the, explicit language in the settlement agreement and then there'd be a practical consideration. Well, how far down winding way will we uh, and uh, will we allow people to have keys if we're going to allow keys for emergency purposes? And I, I felt that that not only was it, wasn't it contemplated, it created some logistical problems. Sure. Um, fire department, public works, whoever would be controlling this. Um, so I'm hoping I'm answering some of the history I, so of this. It's not a question of access through the gate. It's about the question of the the existence of the gate in general, and and what I would say is that this is a section of road that is not going to be widely used. But I, I as one council member, don't like the idea of putting gates up on public roads. So, so the, it's more of a question about setting the precedent. Um, and so, I guess the question is, is, is that a concern? And is is this something that um, can be revisited or is it something that was uh, essentially agreed to and is it, it is very logistically difficult to do so at this time? Yeah, uh, so the, the first question is uh, the gate, um, this is different than some other situations in town because the gate is at the, the uh, at or near where the city limits end. 
so on the other side of the fence, it may not be the precise or the gate at the precise place. It's the county's road, not the city's road. I see. And there are other places where that happens, where, where the county road ends, um, and the and there there's a, a fence or a gate or or some sort of a obstruction. To unwind this, um, you know, I hadn't thought about it too much before tonight, but um, to unwind it, I think it would take, if, if the basis for unwinding it is a claim that the subdivision entitles the parties to access it, well, that is a, a claim that could be made. Um, I, I don't, I can't comment on it any further. I suppose that's a claim that could be made. Um, the, the, uh, the, the settlement agreement could be, uh, uh, you know, somebody could go to court to try and invalidate the settlement agreement by saying that it violated our, the rights to passage. And, and I think that would probably be one theory. Um, I don't know how successful it would be um, given that it's, it's at the border and it's, um, you know, the sub, this, this action is a subsequent action um, that the city took in the annexation. So the annexation might act as a cutoff of the rights for, the, for under the subdivision. And keep in mind, part of this application was a, a series of lot line adjustments that changed the configuration of the lots and substantially reduced the number of lots. So I don't know where that goes in, but, but it's definitely a factual issue on how this works. So there probably is a way to do it, but it's not something um, without direction that, that the, st the city would undertake. Okay. Mr. Grocott? Just to follow up on those, if I might, Craig. So if I heard you correctly, what you're saying is um, where Winding Way will meet the gate, once you go on the other side of the gate past this uh, subdivision, you're in the county. So it's not any different than what we have on Crestview with Belmont, where you get on the other side and it's a different street name and everything, but it's the same street, but there's a block, not even a gate, there's absolute blockage yeah and there's a there's another place that that's similar to that and um, there's another place in palomar park that i'm where pebble drive goes in where there's actually the right of ways actually connect and there's a city limit ends the county road begins and there's a barricade there um, so we do have other places that are like this and just a uh, last question to make sure i heard you correctly if if somebody such as this gentleman or his neighbors along with him wanted to make an issue out of this even after the development has taken place, they're free to do so. You know, I, I, it, it's uh, hard for me to, to give legal advice, but I'm, I'm saying that there may be a way that it could happen. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mr. Albert. Thank you, Bob. Um, I just had a question. Um, there was one, one comment, uh, the gentleman who was talking about the gate. Um, made reference to an assertion or made an assertion that uh, about a city policy that I was not familiar with. So I wanted to educate myself about that first uh, and then see how it might apply here. And that was the assertion that uh, the city rules either do not allow or strongly discourage dead end streets without turnarounds. I think uh, the gentleman was referring to the comment I had made earlier that the fire department um, once the streets, to, once access to go through the streets so they don't have to turn around and, gener and create a turn, mandate a turnaround on the site. So this is the solution that was recognized from the beginning that the gate is important because it was there, that that's what the fire department has always wanted to I, be I'm able asking, to get through. I think I'm asking a somewhat different question, which I just want to make sure I understand. So that ties back to the fire department, fire safety. I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, is there a separate uh, goal, aspiration, whatever you want to call it, in city policy that says just in general uh, for any kind of vehicular traffic, um, if it's not a through road, it, it shouldn't just end. There should be a turnaround. That's and, probably and not my the question that for me it's probably a planning or, or, or engineering actually, department. I was actually question. surprised that you leaped in to answer it. I was <laughs> yeah. expecting one of them to do it. So. Well, I was I was thinking it was that earlier response to my earlier comments. I, so. I understand. Hi, Gareth Harris, your fire marshal. Perhaps I can address that issue. It's actually a, a code issue, a fire code issue. 
uh, which is part of our municipal code because we've adopted the California Fire Code. And so the code says dead end streets greater than 150 feet in length have to have a provision for the turning around of fire apparatus. And so the idea of a dead end street would require a very large turnaround to turn around our largest vehicle is about 60 feet long. And so the idea being, if it's considered a through street, in other words, the fire department can gain access through the gate, then it's considered a through street, and then it wouldn't need the fire apparatus turnaround at the end. So it's not that the fire code prevents dead end streets, it's just that there needs to be a provision, which is a lot of real estate in order to turn around the vehicles. Okay. Um uh, I appreciate that. I I'm going to direct this question now to Jeff because nobody has yet picked up on what I thought I had said pretty clearly is I'd like to know if there is another provision, if there's a provision in the city code not related to fire department that says there's not supposed to be dead end streets because that was the assertion that was made by the gentleman and I'm just curious about whether it actually exists. Somebody ought to know the answer to that question. Unless there's a provision in the general plan, which I'm not, I don't recall and I'm familiar with. I think we're probably talking about the municipal code, and the, which is the yeah. fire code. So there's nothing beyond that. Okay. Yeah. Fine. I mean, the only, uh, as uh, our fire marshal described, that's exactly how I've always understood the issue of courts. I get that logic and I get how the gate substitutes for that, but that was not what the assertion was and that the assertion was what I was trying to test because had it been there, I was going to suggest, why don't we put a turnaround in it? But I won't because it's not in the code. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think my only question I, is uh, for Greg. Uh, there was a comment that the residents were not a party to the settlement agreement of 2004, and in the presentation it said that the settlement agreement was the Devonshire Canyon Open Space Alliance and who? The, the city? Yeah, the, ci the city was the, def was the defendant along with the developer um, in the case. So since the city was, um, is the responsible agency for doing the environmental review, the city becomes a party. We go to the developer under the indemnity provisions of our municipal code that in, in essence brings the developer into the case. The Devonshire um, Open Space um, Alliance, uh, Devonshire Canyon Open Space Alliance was a group of citizens who were the plaintiffs. Now, were I don't, they residents of the area or just? Residents of the area. Um, and I don't, I can't tell you where, which, homes or parcels or properties that the residents lived in, but they were in the, in the, all around the, the general vicinity of, of this project. All right. So we can reasonably assume that the residents who are part of that are potentially many of the residents that are close to this area now. Yes. The, the, the same, some of the same people still live in the area and, and, uh, Mr. Um, Shrey, who wrote a letter earlier at the planning commission level was, he was one of the, parties in that group, but I could right, right now, be, tonight, I can't tell you of who the list of people were and where they lived. That's right. I just want a little clarification. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Grocott. Yeah, one more question. So uh, when we get to this part about parking on the curved portion, um, I'd like to uh, get to that. But just a question um, for now, the developer made in his presentation uh, gave the idea that occasionally, on occasion, they will need to park at the uh, near the entrance of their site, which would be the paved portion of this street that we're talking about. My question is, I'm thinking this might be for the building department. I see one of our staff back there for, uh, with the building department. I don't know if he's here officially or just watching, but. Um, I'm thinking regardless of how much we tighten up that language, for instance, right across the street from my house, uh, a building was put up and they brought in a crane and they pretty much closed down the street while they put in these panels. So it seems to me, and that was, you know, the provision for that I think went through Chris Valley, our chief building official. So it seems to me, regardless of what kind of language we put in there, it's, it's impossible to prevent some type of action that might take place on occurrence with the notice, with permission from the building department. Is that correct? 
But yeah, I guess that might be getting into more of the legal realm or the yeah. billing fish in terms of what the implications are if they don't comply with these conditions. Right. Um, yeah, with the yeah. ramifications. We do have some remedies if, if a condition isn't complied with. We can stop the project until they comply. Um, the, the other... Um, but I'm, the, I'm sorry, Greg. Yeah. More my question was, regardless of what kind of language we put in there, the building official does have some... They, he, he has leeway or... Uh, Al Save, community development director, has a leeway to give permission to a development to close down a street for a period of time. So if they can close down a street, certainly they can allow parking for a certain amount of time as well. Right. I think that what you're talking about, if I'm understanding you, is the, um, the encroachment permit process. So, so when a street is closed, public works, um, the public works director, an application can be made to. Um, encroach on the right-of-way, um, and I suppose separate from this project, someone could do that, but I think that that would be part of the analysis. Well, wait a minute, there's a condition of approval that you can't park in the right-of-way here. Um, I think the, the picture that um, was passed out, um, just to be clear, um, involving this parking issue, um, is the entrance at the lower end on Chesham, right. where the developer was um, saying that occasionally that area might have parking. And I'm interpreting that as to be along the frontage of their property, mm -hmm. that where they might need to temporarily park during, during the, the construction period. But that is off the public right of way or off the paved portion of the street is what I think. It's on their property. It's on their property or a, off the street and not blocking the street, which so, I think so is the intention. council adopts the language that you brought up earlier, it still would allow them to park on their own property? On their own property, yeah. yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So, gentlemen, what would you like to do on this? Want a motion? Fair. Yes. Oh, I move to adopt resolution 2018-86. 86, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos finding at the Certified Final Focused Environmental Impact Report, FFEIR, for the Winding Way Project, SCH number 20050062052, and addendum, adequately analyze environmental impacts associated with the Winding Way Project, APNs 049-020-010 and 049-141-660-670-680-0. And, and adopting the addendum. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, resol um, roll call please. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. And Mayor Gasilli? Yes. Next item on next resolution, is there a motion? No, because I can't read. I thought Mr. Goldberg was on a roll there. So. I, I move to adopt resolution 2018-87. I guess that. 87, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos approving the master development plan, lot line adjustment, and tree removal applications for the Winding Way project, APN 049020-010 and 049-141-660-670-680 and-690. And Greg, can I put in and, it, and w as amended to reflect uh, Greg Rubin's comments about uh, restricting parking both on and along the, the roadway? Yeah, that's in the record. It's on the tape. I think we can draft uh, an amended condition to number 16 to this resolution. It's condition 16. Okay. I second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, a roll call, please. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. And Mayor Gasilli? Yes. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt resolution 2018 88. 88. A resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos summarily vacating three segments of the winding way right of way easement. I second. Moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Collins, question, discussion? Just, uh, just a comment. Um, this project's taken a long time. Um, I want to commend the developer for their patience and perseverance. It's been quite a while. Predates all of our, well, no. most of our times oh. on the council. <laughs> Not all of us. Most of our times. Some of us are old. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, uh, and we got old working yeah. on this project. <laughs> but uh, I, I've had a lot of 
over the years, a lot of calls and emails from people dissatisfied that, you know, the planning department or the public works department or the city engineer was too strict, too onerous uh, rules and, and uh, hurdles that they had to get by that, that uh, they thought were just uh, too difficult. And we have a situation here where, you know, all of those hurdles have been passed. The city engineer has passed on it. Um, so I am, you know, if the city engineer, which, is, you know, our engineering and public works departments are, are, there are no pushovers. And if they're satisfied with this project, that's, that's enough for me. Um, and then just the final comment, I know that there's, there are some concerned neighbors, and I would just say to Mr. Grove and, and, the, and the other developers that, you know, just be respectful of the owners and where you park and, and, and how you run your project. Uh, I know you know, already know that, but the, the reason I mention it is that when there is a violation or even a perceived violation, guess who they write first? All of us. You know, sometimes they call the city, but lots of times we get the emails. So that would be really my only comment. Otherwise, I think uh, everyone's done uh, a, a great job in uh, getting this project uh, to, before us. Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. And Mayor Gasilli? Yes. All right. That item is done. Thank you. If folks want to leave, uh, we'll take a couple of minutes or a minute. Sure. Anytime I want to get something done. Yeah, I'm mean, seriously. I remember. Walk, I would think I didn't we walk it before 2000. Inc. to purchase and install mobile automated license plate readers, ALPRs, ALPRs, on 10 patrol vehicles and two parking vehicles in the total amount of $200,556.50 and appropriate $210,000 for this purpose. Chief? Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mayor, City Council, and staff, uh, Chief Mark Dury. And I'm uh, here to request um, you consider uh, and adopt uh, the resolution to uh, purchase mobile ALPR readers uh, for 10 of our patrol vehicles and two of our uh, CSO parking enforcement vehicles. Um, as you know, well, what we use the ALPRs for is uh, to locate stolen and wanted uh, vehicles and, su and subjects uh, that we're uh, trying to investigate and locate and apprehend individuals and subjects to arrest warrants and otherwise lawfully uh, sought by law enforcement. Um, we also locate witnesses and victims of violent crimes and is also utilized to lo uh, locate missing persons and uh, subjects that are involved in any kind of Amber Alert. Um, as you know that we uh, have um, nine fixed uh, ALPR systems throughout the city, and um, I'm proposing again uh, to uh, mobilize this ALPR technology in our patrol vehicles and CSO vehicles. I know in my staff report I've uh, delineated uh, various um, uh, successes we've had, but I also have a few more that I'd like to tell you about tonight. Um, one case, uh, it was a burglary and a brandishing. Uh, there was a burglary over off of airport in Sky, or Skyway Drive. Uh, as the burglars uh, finished burglarizing uh, various vehicles on the way out, they brandished uh, a few witnesses, threatening them that if they call police that they'll be back for them. Uh, based on the description of the vehicle that uh, the witness that we got from the witnesses, because they did call us, even though they were threatened not to, um, we were able to uh, get the vehicle description and the license plate. Uh, based on uh, what they gave us, we were able to utilize the ALPR system to uh, find a, a vehicle out of the Central Valley. Uh, because of the burglary and the, and the weapon that was used, we sent our crime suppression unit down to do some reconnaissance and surveillance. Um, they spent a day or so down there uh, where the vehicle was registered to, and they did not find the vehicle or they did not find the suspect matching the description. Um, 
they were able to uh, find a description of the registered owner of the vehicle through a Cal photo ID. And uh, when that individual left in a, in a different vehicle, they effected a traffic stop and uh, contacted that subject. Uh, it was not the subject we were looking for, but uh, lo and behold, through the interviews, they were able to find that that subject had sold that vehicle to someone in San Leandro. Based on the information we got from that subject and the information we got on who we sold the vehicle to, uh, we were able to locate the subject we believed uh, committed that crime. Um, based on a photo lineup with all the witnesses in place, uh, they identified the exact suspect that committed that burglary who that gentleman sold the vehicle to. Based on the AOPR technology, we were able to solve that crime um, based on our investigation and the information at hand. That's one story. Another story uh, uh, is a burglary over of, off of Laser Quest. Uh, subject burglarized two vehicles, and uh, after the burglary occurred, um, we got a description of the vehicle, and it was a stolen vehicle that was registered, or that was uh, um, a stolen vehicle that uh, we were able to tie to this subject. Um, the subject uh, had the vehicle for two or three days. We encountered the, the suspect and on various occasions, tried to pursue him. We couldn't pursue him. Uh, we had to let him go because of our vehicle pursuit policy. So we turned this over to our crime, uh, crime suppression unit. And uh, based on the stolen vehicle and who stole it and who were able to identify who had the vehicle, he, uh, the subject based on his prior contacts was deemed as armed and dangerous. And they were able to locate him days later in San Mateo. As they approached the vehicle, um, knowing that the subject was armed and dangerous, uh, as they approached on both sides, the, the suspect went for his uh, waistband and had a firearm in his waistband. Um, as the deputy approached on one side, he drew down on him, and the other deputy was able to go in the window and apprehend the suspect and take the, the weapon out of his waistband, and he was taken into custody for the stolen vehicle and both the burglaries. Again, identified because of the ALPR uh, system. Um, and there's one more, actually, a good one that um, out of Redwood City that's recently, it was recent in the news. Um, in the middle of last month, the Redwood City Police Department uh, responded to an in progress domestic violence. Um, when they uh, arrived, uh, the victim was there, was beaten um, by her boyfriend, and the boyfriend had left. Um, after further investigation with the uh, Redwood City detectives, uh, the victim confided that she had been working as a prostitute for about a month uh, for the suspect, who was actually her boyfriend as well. And as a means of control and enslavement, uh, the suspect kept uh, the victim and her money and her cell phone and purse and her identification and denied her food and made her sleep in her car. On the night she was contacted by the Redwood City Police when the domestic violence occurred, uh, the suspect, again, as I indicated before, uh, beat her and stole all her possessions. Um, they took all the information of the vehicle and the suspect and they put it in the ALPR system. Uh, days later, uh, officers in Merced Police Department stopped the suspect in their city after receiving a hit on their mobile automated license plate readers and from the information that Redwood City put into the system. Uh, the street crime suppression team uh, responded for Redwood City and um, went down to Merced and identified the suspect. Um, and the suspect was uh, subse su subsequently arrested and booked in the San Mateo County Jail for human trafficking, pimping, pandering, robbery, domestic violence, extortion, and assault. Another, uh, another victory for the ALPRs. And this one was actually a mobile ALPR. Um, and we are also currently working on another uh, In-N-Out Burger, uh, in -out, a burglary from In-N-Out Burger, where we have uh, identified a suspect in, via LPR hit. Um, we're very successful with our fixed systems. We'll even be more successful with our mobile systems if approved. Um, what I can say really about the, the LPR systems here and within San Mateo County, even Northern California, um, based on what we've done and based really on your vision and leadership, the city council here and the city manager and just the city of San Carlos and embarking on the fixed systems, I think we can make that much more headway in um, stopping crime in the city and in San Mateo County and abroad with these mobile systems as well. Um, and I'm gonna leave you with this. Uh, this um, 
also meets the public safety and strategic goals outlined in the City of San Carlos 2018 strategic plan. So we have been planning for these uh, uh, mobile ALPRs for a little while now, and uh, we're ready to move forward with that. Okay, thank you, Chief. Mr. Albert. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Chief. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I, I always get uh, both confused and a little bit concerned with the ability, who has the ability to access the data that gets generated from this equipment? And I know that once, my understanding is once the data gets into the regional center, uh, it's very difficult for anybody who's not A, a law enforcement officer, and B, somebody who, you know, an active investigation of some kind to get access to it. That's correct. But I, I keep reading articles about uh, uh, purported deals that I guess the hardware vendor, Vigilant, mm -hmm. has made with other parties where it may be that the data sort of gets siphoned off before it gets into the control network, um, the controlled network that I was just describing. Um, do you have any insight to shed on that or, or I don't necessarily give a high degree of credibility to the things I read, but I read an awful lot of them. Uh, no, well, we don't have any of those kind of issues. It's very strict. You have to be trained on the system and to utilize the system. And we can only draw information, license plates or anything that are in the system. We can't, we don't really have any kind of, uh, kind of tracking capability where we're tracking people. We, we can put information in and if something comes about, we can draw it out if, if there's a hit, but it's just really a data collection tool that is second to none. I think I may be, I may have confused, I may be asking a slightly different question, and, if, and you may not have the answer tonight, in which case I'd just like to follow up with you. But um, what I'm really asking is, you, you were describing the proper constraints about accessing the data from the warehouse once it's there. What I'm really asking is, since the hardware is coming from this third party company called Vigilant, is it possible, it, it does, does the data, when it comes out of the device in the car, does it go through their servers on the way to, to the, uh, I see Kate's shaking your head, yes. Um, does it go through their servers on the way to uh, the controlled warehouse that you were describing the limited access to? And if so, do they have the ability to sort of say, well, we're gonna cut a deal with some other agency and sort of siphon that data off and let them look at it? Uh, I don't believe that's the case, but I would have to look into it more on that, on that scope to give you more of a definitive answer. Let, let's follow up on that. We can do that offline. I mean, unless anybody else is interested, um, because I, I am concerned about that because uh, I want to make sure that uh, I, I have, I do have issues about the length of time for which we are storing the data, but I have less issues with properly vetted and regulated law enforcement people using data than I do some third party organization. Okay. Um, I noticed that that um, the proposal here also covers installing some of the mobile units in the parking and in at least a couple of parking enforcement vehicles. Yes. Um, is is that going to be used to be able to uh, track people who are parking too long in places, or is it just that you're using them as, well, those vehicles are going around too, so we want to use them as a mobile platform? Just a mobile platform. Those vehicle, those cameras will be, poor, uh, will be pointed, obviously, to the right on how they, how they uh, enforce parking, and it just is a, another data collection platform for us. They won't be tracking anyone for parking, or we don't really track anyone. It's really a data collection system that we draw information out, being timely and putting different vehicles in different places. Okay. Um, I wouldn't, by the way, personally, I wouldn't necessarily have had a problem if you were going to use it for parking enforcement. I just was curious if that's <laughs> Under, what you're Understood. Do. Um, and then th the last thing, which is probably more of a comment than a question, uh, it, was I correct in, am I correct in hearing that some of the examples you were giving us of where the, the, the systems were being used were crimes that were resolved that were outside of San Carlos? In other words, they were using automated license plate reader like Redwood City? Yeah, um, yes. Uh, Redwood City, well, Redwood City, that was a um, uh, mobile uh, automated license plate reader out of a Merced. They entered their plate in the system as a wanted, and he was driving through Merced, and uh, the auto, uh, ALPR picked it up and, and dinged in the car and it said, hey, that's a wanted car here, and, and then they affected the traffic stop. In Merced. In Merced. Okay. Um, for what it's worth for me, uh, one of the things that I look at in these kind of expenditures is... Uh, the return we're getting for our investment. And so for me, the, the more valuable to figure that out uh, uses are what your guys are using them for to solve issues in San Carlos. 
uh, it's not that I object to using you know, information, it's just that um, I'm not really looking at investing in general in automated license plate readers, I'm investing in them in San Carlos. So. Well, all the other examples I gave you uh, were in San Carlos. So it was just that one? It was just that one. Okay. Uh, that, that's a recent mobile one that shows you that if a crime occurred, if that crime would have occurred in San Carlos, in that gentleman, you could have that, picked him up we could have picked him up in Merced. I, I was just giving you kind of, I was giving you kind of the in-house version here, the first examples, and to show kind of where the reach for ALPR is and the solvability of crimes because of it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Grocott? I'm curious about the um, difference between how these cameras get used when they're on a vehicle a patrol vehicle versus uh, the stationary ones, and perhaps even the, you're, you're mentioning about the parking enforcement vehicles. I take it that would be like the little carts that run around. And, yeah, they, they and, call them the, the gophers. Yeah. So if you could. How would they? Um, yeah, how are they the, used the, differently? Because l let me just give you the background of my question is, it is for me, um, I, as you may know, I'm really troubled by license plate readers that are just picking up people who are driving around or what you just answered uh, Mr. Olbert with, it seems to me even a parking enforcement uh, vehicle that is just passing by and it's picking up, you know, all these people that are parked at Williams Plaza or wherever in San Carlos. That to me is an infringement on people's right to privacy when it's on a vehicle, and this is my interpretation of it, so this is what I'm looking for clarification on. A police officer is, or a sheriff's deputy is following a vehicle on El Camino, and I've seen them do this. They follow along for a little while, they read the license plate, they, uh, you can tell they're punching it in, they're getting information on that vehicle. And if there's any reason because of the information that comes back to make a, a stop, they will. Um, but they don't always, you know, they, they don't necessarily stop the vehicle. There's uh, a lot of times they run a plate and it's all clear. So they just move on. But I know, I, I'm pretty sure that gets done. You can clear that, fi that for me. I could see that the, where perhaps these readers on a vehicle can less than the time that it takes a, a deputy or a police officer to, to go through the machinations. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm trying to understand. Okay, the first part of your question is yes, is the deputy, um, the deputy has uh, the authority to type in a license plate number and bring it up on their screen or to radio it in and they'll get it verbally from the dispatcher. Uh, what ALPRs do, it just, it just collects data. It doesn't bring anything up on a screen. He'll physically have to go in to if he's looking for a certain license plate to bring that out. So what this is doing is just collecting data and putting it in a system. So um, the way it would work on a, on a patrol vehicle, it'll have a camera going forward and backwards. So we could, it could uh, collect a license plate going from, from the front and the back. And uh, if two months down the line, we find out there's a crime in San Carlos and this vehicle was involved, we can punch in the license plate and this, we can put that vehicle here because that, that it's been collected. Uh, just because it's collecting all this data, we don't look at all this data. We try to extract the data if it's there when we're trying to solve a crime. So it's not really a big brother aspect. It's just a data collection tool that helps us pinpoint where the suspects are or where they're not, or they said, hey, I, I, w I wasn't in San Carlos at the time. I was over here and we can prove that you are because we can place the vehicle here. So it's just a data collection tool. Um, uh, it's similar, your questions are similar, but we're not running every plate or checking every plate. But isn't it true also though, you, you can place the vehicle, but it almost in the, I think this was in the example you gave you were able to place the vehicle, but you weren't able to place necessarily who was driving the vehicle. And I think of a situation, for example, where, <laughs> a little story here, I'm riding my bike on Woodside Road, and uh, uh, there's four guys in a car go, go by me, and one of them whips out a towel, I guess they'd been swimming or something, and whacks me in the back of the helmet. Um, I chased down the car, got a description, 
at Rob, near Robert's store and then called it into the uh, sheriff's department when I you know, was able to. They tracked these guys down in, in uh, East Palo Alto. Uh, they had me get in the sheriff's vehicle, go over there. They had the guys sitting on, all the guys sitting on the curb, but because I couldn't identify the one that whacked me with the towel, it was no deal. <laughs> so kind of a similar thing. You have to be able to put that person in the vehicle, not just the vehicle. That's true, and that, that goes on, but it, it is still an investigative tool, and, and that's why I use that, uh, that scenario on we, uh, we got the car, and it was registered as a certain person, and we couldn't place them together, but based on the further investigation, we were able to find him that he sold it to someone else who didn't register it to himself, and based on the photo lineup that we used from the second person we located, based on the interview of the original car owner, we were able to pinpoint them out of, a, a, we call it a six-pack. We, we generally provide uh, uh, witnesses or victims with uh, six photos, and they have to select the person, sort of like you did. Yeah. And out of six, um, both people selected the correct person. Okay. And then uh, last question, similar to, to what Mr. Olbert was asking, is there, when the information is going from the camera, in the police vehicle or, or whether it's stationary or whatever, it, it has to go through some kind of pipeline. Is there any uh, guarantee that we can have that as it's going from the vehicle into the data center that somebody isn't able to hack it, siphon it off, and so forth? I can give you the same guarantee that we gave you when we, you authorized the fixed ones. That's what that's what it's uh, vigilant has guaranteed us that it's secure. Vigilant has mm -hmm. guaranteed that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, don't see any more questions, Chief. Uh, we do have one speaker card though, uh, Kate Fuff. Thank you, honorable members of the council. I strongly urge you not to expand the use of automated license plate readers in the city of San Carlos. I spoke to you not long ago, I think it was in March, about my concerns over privacy, police overreach, fraudulent use, and the potential misuse of such broad data collection on the lives of innocent private citizens. At that time, you chose to expand the number of ALPRs then and uh, lengthen the data retention policy to a year. Since then, as well, Vigilant Solutions has now signed a contract with ICE for data access nationwide, and I ask you to consider that change since what happened at the meeting in March. So the privacy concerns have only increased um, since the last time this was considered. And now the sheriff's office is asking for more mobile ALPRs at a cost of $200,000. And I, in reviewing the strategic plan, I see there's even a call for potentially equipping every city vehicle, including non-law enforcement vehicles, with the power of mass public surveillance on our movements. And I say enough is enough. So let's look at the numbers. And my numbers here are coming from a Portola Valley uh, report, a staff report that was online on ALPRs from 2017 that they did. So in the city of San Mateo, two patrol cars with ALPRs in a 12-hour shift collected over 10,000 images. We have nine ALPRs in the city already for 30,000 people, and that's a capacity to collect 90,000 license plate images a day in a city of 30,000. So I would think that the sheriff has the tools that he needs to monitor people from outside of town through the fixed ALPRs at locations at, uh, at the margins of the city. He has mobile units that can be deployed to targeted areas where crimes are being committed, as he has previously mentioned. So what can be the possible justification for a dozen more devices on top of 90,000 plates a day? When does it stop? when you've achieved total information awareness on every citizen's movement. I also object to the staff report being written by the police captain who's asking for the funding instead of being an unbiased staff opinion. For instance, the staff report states that the ACLU was wildly enthusiastic about the policy and even included a quote. But at our last meeting in March, when the policy changed and the data retention policy changed, the ACLU was not happy at all about the expanding uh, data retention and again, the ICE contract that's happened since then. 
In addition, this policy, whatever the city's policy is, has now disappeared from public view. It's not on the city's website as required by the SB 34 law. It's not on the county sheriff's website, which links to the Nick Crick policy, but not the county's own data retention and privacy policy. So a police force that is unable to currently comply with privacy laws on ALPRs would like us to pay $200,000 to expand their ability to watch our every move and expand even more in the future. So no thank you. Here's what I suggest instead. Could you uh, wrap it up, please? I will. Thank you. Here's what I suggest instead. The actual studies have shown that increased patrols, especially slow patrols, are as effective as ALPRs in deterring crime and catching property crime. In the six years of living on Cordilleras Avenue here in the city, I'm not sure I've ever seen a police car on slow patrol and I live near a school on a fairly decent sized road. So for $200,000, you could pay for additional police patrols and increase the human intelligence of our police force instead of the raw AI. Um, in wrapping up, uh, yes, you should be concerned about vigilant. You should ask why they're charging uh, many people for, like they, their business model is to both get money from you for collecting data and then charging other people to access that data. So they're making money coming and going and you should be concerned that all the data is passing through their server and is hackable, yes. Ma'am, I'm gonna really have to ask you to stop. I mean, you've already gone over two minutes already. You've now spoken for five minutes, okay? So. Well, I'd like a citizen panel to have some oversight over the increasing police surveillance in this city. You have a citizen right here. We're all five citizens, okay? We got elected, and that's what our job is to do, okay? Other Thank cities you. have decided to do a lot more. Thank you for your comments. Okay, um, what do you gentlemen want to do? Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question uh, sure. of Jeff or... Uh, Chief Terry, what is SB 34? She mentioned something about an SB 34 law violation. Does anybody know what that is? I would have to look that up. I don't. All right. That was really all I, I wanted to know. All right. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mayor. Is ours posted? I don't know if it's on the website, but our Lexapol policy is uh, public information and our ALPR policy is in that. Thank you. All right. I know ours was, but with the recent cut over to the new website, I'll have to verify with staff that that was properly cut over. If it's not, it will be. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you're looking for a, uh, yep. a motion? Or something. All right. Um, I move to adopt resolution 2018-89. 89. 89. A resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos authorizing the City Manager to enter into an agreement with Vigilant Solutions, LLC, and Priority One Public Safety Equipment Installation, Inc. to purchase and install mobile automated license plate readers, ALPRs, on 10 patrol vehicles and two parking vehicles in the total amount of $200,556.50 and appropriate $210,000 for this purpose. I second. All right, moved and seconded. Uh, the only thing I'd like to say is, Chief, I think it is a good question to see, and I'm sure you'll get it from Mr. Robert, that you could maybe get the answer to all of us about the vigilant, about, you know, if, if it goes off the side pipeline or just goes straight through, that'd be I'll great. i that for you tomorrow. Thanks a lot, appreciate it, Chief. All right, anything um, else? Yes, yes. And, and by the way, I wasn't trying to cut the rest of you guys out, I just wasn't sure if you were interested, I know I was, so. Fine, no problem. Um, uh, I'm going to be voting against this, um, and but I want to make clear that that uh, I very much support what the chief is trying to do in terms of keeping the community safe. Um, uh, I'm not too concerned about the cost effectiveness issue of it. I'm not um, um, I'm not happy about the data being stored for more than six months, which is what the original compromise was. But you know that's why there were five of us. Um, but I do have sort of an increasing level of concern and questions just about all the stuff I read about vigilant. Uh, and their role here, because they, they are not you, Chief. I mean, I, I respect you and the rules that you and the Sheriff's Department follow, but they're somebody else, um, and they don't necessarily have to follow our rules. So uh, that's why I'm gonna be voting against this. Thank you. All right. All right, we've got, uh, Ms. Collins, do you have another comment? Or uh, yeah, just vote? a final comment. The reason I'm supporting this is that this really comes down to a matter of trust. Um, we've had this discussion now for, I believe, three years, and they've been in practice. 
I haven't seen it abused. If it was ever abused uh, in our area, I think we'd find out and we could do something about it. So as long as that trust factor is there, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. All right, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Council Obert? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? No. Mayor Vasily? Yes. All right, moving on. Um, 8B, consideration of adopting a resolution accepting $6 million from Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, arising out of a settlement agreement approved by the California Public Utilities Commission, CPUC. Is there a report on this? Yes, there is, Mr. Mayor, and we'll make it a quick report. Uh, just for sake of the public, uh, we'll provide a brief overview of the history with uh, Line 147, which began uh, just about five years ago next month uh, when the city was notified that a leak had occurred and been repaired on uh, Line 147, which the city and the CPUC at the time were not properly notified of. When that came to light, pg e was in the process of turning over um, a whole number of emails to the CPUC and they wanted to bring to our attention that uh, that issue had happened and in the correspondence following the issue that there were concerns expressed by pg e engineers that potentially line 147 could be another San Bruno situation. And when that information was shared with me, I was very concerned. Our, our public works director uh, was there. Um, afterwards, as you might imagine, we had a number of questions for the PG&E folks that were making that presentation. And those questions uh, weren't answered to our satisfaction. They led to a number of other questions. And what we tried to do at the staff level was quickly uh, escalate our requests uh, up the chain of command at PG&E to higher and higher level officials requesting simply that they temporarily shut the line down until they could explain uh, to the city council uh, what was done to the line to resolve the concerns of the engineers and that we were no longer considered to be a potential San Bruno situation with line 147. Uh, PG&E unfortunately uh, refused and uh, I notified the council that I was uh, gonna be declaring a, a state of emergency and asked that the council uh, convene a special meeting of the city council to consider ratifying uh, my decision, which the five of you did uh, the following day. After that, uh, our city attorney was able to get a court order that PG&E did comply with. Uh, the line was shut down for quite a long time while a number of improvements were made to the line. As you recall, uh, the line didn't have the capability at the time of being pigged, which is the nickname for the inspection probe that's put through the line. So PG&E began uh, improving the infrastructure on both ends so that they could both launch and receive a pig in the future in the pipeline. They also had to make a number of uh, pipeline section modifications so that the pig could navigate some of the twists and turns that were too tight for the probe at that time. This took a, well over a year once they started to complete. Uh, and then they were using new technology, uh, I believe out of Germany, uh, to pig the line. Uh, the first probe was unsuccessful in, in providing scanning data and, and ultimately um, didn't survive the testing process as I understand it. Uh, the second pig was successful and the line was tested. That testing resulted in over a dozen uh, uh, deficiencies in the pipe being identified uh, and ultimately uh, rep repaired and improved to our satisfaction and the satisfaction of experts that uh, we had worked with to uh, provide third party review of the data. Uh, once that was all completed and those repairs were eventually made, uh, the city agreed and the CPUC agreed and last year the line uh, began to operate uh, at its 
uh, allowed capacity again. Along the way, uh, PG&E um, incurred a number of uh, legal issues and a number of fines, which our city attorney uh, working with uh, outside legal counsel has been very successful in addressing. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg for a quick briefing on that. Well, I'll, I'll fill in some of the, the, the uh, details about the, the um, legal um, um, remedies that we pursued um, against PG&E um, at the beginning and, and more recently. So in, uh, at the beginning of the process, um, as Jeff said, we, we, uh, we took the, the issue of these emails extremely seriously and, and took strong, a strong action as we felt we, we needed to do to, to um, get the attention of um, the CPUC and PG&E that we took this, um, this leak that they failed to notify us uh, uh, very seriously and we expected them to, com to comply with our request, which we felt was very reasonable at the time. You know, it was in the fall and, and the, the arguments that they were making about um, there not being enough gas uh, didn't seem to resonate at all in uh, October of 2013 when we weren't in cold weather season yet. So again, they refused to do that, so we took legal action and, and I uh, was successful in obtaining a restraining order to uh, get the line to be depressurized in a safe manner. So segue to the future, you know, Jeff covered some of the, the, the fines and, and um, uh, disciplinary actions undertaken by the CPC um, arising out of um, some of that conduct. Uh, but in 2015, um, uh, um, the CPC, uh, uh, after the, um, San Bruno was successful in obtaining some public records, which included um, e emails um, related to our proceedings before the CPUC, um, um, issued an OSC why the, um, in order to show cause why the, the uh, PG&E should not be fined for um, these emails that were violations of the CPUC rules. So that, that was the more recent activity that led to the negotiation of and the um, settlement agreement that the council approved earlier in the year um, a, that provided for $97.5 million in financial penalties to, to PG&E and uh, some non-financial penalties involving disclosure of contacts that are more stringent than the CPC rules and the $6 million to the city's general fund um, which was designed to um, punish and uh, pg and &E for the conduct and to compensate the city for the, the uh, um, what we went through, frankly, and the costs that we incurred in defending ourselves and representing the citizens. So the, the, uh, the, the city, um, the, the interesting part of the, the legal um, analysis is that the city under the CPC rules, the, the only way a city can receive intervene, what's called intervener compensation is when the city uh, is, has physical damage to its residents or its infrastructure. And, and luckily for San Carlos, even though the, the line did have, um, as Jeff mentioned, several defects that were uncovered later in the process, we um, didn't have physical damage from, from the pipeline. So we probably, um, the CPC would have been, it would have been a very difficult to, if we went to hearing at the CPC to get the, any kind of compensation even to reimburse us for the substantial costs that we had and that were incurred basically at PG&E's request. So uh, the settlement was um, very uh, advantageous to the city because it enabled us to receive the, the settlement funds uh, and um, which were, um, which the CPC ultimately awarded at when they approved the settlement, but that was a, a legal question that we had some concerns about through this process. So tonight, what, what we're at from a legal standpoint, to, to kind of uh, make a conclusion to, to the acceptance of the $6 million, you know, there is a government code section that requires the city to accept um, uh, personal property. And um, so we wanted to make sure that the record reflected that yes, th we have formally accepted it, even though there's a signed settlement agreement, it just seemed like a loose um, uh, issue there that we wanted to make sure um, we had in the record and a resolution of doing that. So legally, that's what you're doing tonight. You're accepting the $6 million. 
Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. just in conclusion, uh, a couple more comments. Uh, one, the council's given us previous direction on uh, what what to do with the money. Uh, One million dollars is to be put into the city's affordable housing fund. Two million dollars is to be set aside for a potential uh, future uh, grant to a, a local uh, community foundation nonprofit ser serving uh, San Carlos, and uh, three million to go towards the Holly 101 pedestrian and intersection uh, project that we'll be starting uh, construction here next year. Um, I was very proud to work with the city council on this issue. I, I hope not to have another issue quite like this in my career. Uh, it was difficult. I think our staff really, really rose to the occasion. We were very much in the public spotlight for quite a while. Um, I think the, the council did a great job and was very thoughtful in their approach. It's a, my opinion that it's really never a good idea to enter into a, a legal dispute with another governmental agency or quasi-governmental agency if it can be avoided uh, because you're spending public money on both sides of the equation and a utility is a quasi-public entity. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, our, our request for a reasonable, uh, a reasonable answer and a, a reasonable solution to the problem relative to the threat that was potentially being proposed by their own staff uh, just sort of forced our hand in this instance. Uh, you broke a lot of new ground in the state of California in your actions as a council. Uh, I think you've improved safety considerably uh, for millions of people in the state of California. And you have, I think, um, as much as any other entity in the state of California, forced PG&E to live up to what they've been saying about their commitment to safety. And hopefully in the future, rather than having to spend money on fines and, and penalties, uh, they can spend that money on improving infrastructure and doing the proper testing and maintenance along the way. Because at the end of the day, we would much rather to see that happen in the future than a repeat of what we went through for the last five years. So thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Malpe, Mr. Rubens. Uh, Mr. Albert, do you have a comment? Actually, I had a question. Um, but I'll, I'll add a comment in the beginning saying, yes, thank you, uh, Greg, for all, the, all your hard work on this, and, and Jeff as well. Um, and uh, I, I will never forget the uh, scene up at the, the first meeting we had with PG&E senior management when I was there with Vice Mayor and I was there with uh, Mayor Bob, because Bob's always been mayor. Awesome. Everything yeah, happens when, <laughs> when Bob's mayor. Um, and that was, uh, that was a, uh, do you remember that meeting? That was a very strange meeting. I remember that meeting. I thought at one point you were going to go over the table at the guy. Um, but, um, and justifiably so, I should add. Um, my question actually, it, it does relate to line 147. Um, I think we all got some emails about some, an individual who has a right of way where line 147 goes through his residential property. And he had some questions about concerns about trees that PG&E was asking him to remove. And uh, uh, I met with him along with Jeff and a number of the senior staff members. And in the course of that conversation, the homeowner mentioned that someplace up the hill behind him, line 147 had kind of eroded out of the ground. Um, and so my question is, do we have any updates on what's going on with that? I don't believe we have an update yet, uh, but we have our, our public works director is uh, gonna be hiring somebody to investigate that's in a, a difficult, very unaccessible uh, location. So we're gonna get people up there, get photographs of the location, work with any property owners we have to, to get access. Is the plan to, um, I would be interested in knowing the results. If anybody else would be, perhaps if there's two other people who wanna see this, maybe we agendize some staff report about it, but um, I don't know. I'd like, to, I'd like to know what happens. Yeah, the council would like a report back uh, in open session. We'd be happy to do that. I, a good I, idea. I, I see a lot of heads nodding. A, so. I didn't get a. Oh, okay. I did, you, know, you never know. I just assumed yeah. it went to everybody. No. So. so. Okay. All right. Well, we have a, a, a motion on the, or a uh, resolution to perhaps adopt here. I move, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. I move to adopt resolution 2018 90. 90, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos, accepting $6 million from Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, arising out of the settlement agreement approved by the California Public Utilities Commission, CPUC. Okay. I second. All right, moved and seconded. Uh, hearing no discussion, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? 
Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. And Mayor Grisilli? Yes. Okay, moving on, 8C. Consideration of adopting resolution amending the employment agreement with Jeff D. Malpe, city manager. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, uh, based on state law, I have to recuse myself and leave the room for this item. So I'm gonna switch places with uh, Tara Peterson now and uh, wish you a good night. Can I wait a minute, wait, don't wait, you have wait, to come wait, back and do the staff report? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not allowed to do that. I, I think it's near. I think I have to recuse my, no. I'm just <laughs> well, I think, uh, uh, Mayor and uh, Council Members, I am uh, presenting the report I, I, that I prepared. Um, so the, the uh, what's before you tonight on, on this agenda item is uh, a, uh, a, a amendment uh, or change to the compensation provisions of the city manager's employment agreement. The, there's there's two um, proposed changes. Um, one is that the um, that the council authorize uh, thirteen thousand eight hundred dollars per year to the uh, existing four fifty seven account that the city manager um, has right now. The effect of that is, is essentially um, changing uh, the having a city pay for the partial funding of that account. That account um, can, ha can have up to $18,500 um, in it. So the city manager, if he wanted to fully fund it, he would, he would fund be funding that with his money. Um, and then there's an increase in the life insurance benefit uh, that's being proposed from 200,000 to 400,000. And I think that the reason for that, um, this, the reason that's being recommended is that it kind of brings it in line with uh, um, what the compensation the city manager receives, the 200,000 is below his base salary and, and uh, it seems uh, logical that it be more in line with um, you know, one and a half times of, of his, uh, his gross salary um, you know, to protect his family and such. So um, those are the, the main changes. And it's, I also, in the, in the letter, it restates that the, the cost of living, the automatic cost of living uh, adjustments will continue. Um, I just thought it was important that since we're looking at it again, that we make it clear that that continues. So that's the, the end of the staff report um, on this item. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Any questions for uh, Mr. Rubens? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution 2018- 91. 91, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending the employment agreement with Jeff D. Maltby, City Manager. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilmember Grocott? No. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Overt? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Mayor Grisilli? Yes. All right, moving on, item 8D, consideration of adopting resolution awarding discretionary bonus to Jeff D. Maltby, city manager, pursuant to terms of the existing employment agreement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, this, this item is something um, new to the council. Uh, um, it's a discretionary um, performance bonus for the city manager. It's been in the city manager's employment agreement since 2014, um, but the council has not decided to provide the, the discretionary bonus uh, since that time. City manager's um, performance was last reviewed in 2016. So what's being recommended is um, uh, the performance bonus up to what the, the contract allows, 10% of his gross salary for the, for the past two years, um, ending at the June 30th, 2018, excuse me, 2017 and 2018. Um, and the amounts are 25,311 for um, June 30th, up to June 30th, 2017, and $25,692 for the period ending June 30th, 2018. Um, those are uh, this, those funds would come out of the general fund, uh, and there is a sufficient balance in the general fund um, to pay for that bonus that the council has uh, included in the city manager's contract. Um, I might add that the the reason for the the um, uh, the amount being recommended is based upon the the positive and, and outstanding review the the. City Council provided to the city manager um, for the past few years, um, and so um, with that, it's your it's your decision um, on the amount of the bonus. But that's the the recommendation based upon the performance review that was provided. Okay. Any questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. 
Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt resolution 2018-92. 92, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos awarding a discretionary bonus to Jeff D. Maltby, City Manager, pursuant to the terms of the existing employment agreement. I second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, Mr. Grocott. So I didn't make any comment on the previous action because I wanted to consolidate. Um, and I want to make a point here. Uh, I've actually voted against all the uh, employment agreements that have come across the dais recently and I wish now to make a statement of why. And that is because number one, the 3% automatic cost of living adjustment I don't think is proper. Um, I much prefer what we've done with the city manager where we offer a, a bonus for getting the job done as opposed to something being automatic. And one of the reasons I do not like the 3% cost of living adjustment is because uh, it's, it's a little bit, um, like the dog chasing its tail, I guess might be a, a way to put it, in that much of the inflation we experience uh, is a result of government costs going up. And then government is government, people who work in government are benefiting from that because they're getting a cost of living adjustment. And meanwhile, people who work in the private sector, majority, do not get such adjustments. They have to go in and, and do a review and, and so forth, similar to what we've done with the city manager. But um, you know, I, I know, for example, with my wife and where she works, there's no cost of living uh, automatic adjustment. She has to write a report about how she did for the year and give expectations for the next year and meet certain goals and so forth. Again, similar to what we do with, with Jeff on this bonus. Um, but nothing is automatic. And uh, I think that's not really the proper way to go. And that's why I have voted against those. And then lastly, because uh, a concern of mine that I raised a number of years ago had to do with uh, unfunded liabilities and pensions. And the more we increase uh, salaries of employees, the more that becomes a problem. And I just don't think the state is taking it seriously enough. Uh, the unfunded liabilities, and so far, so long as they're not, it's really difficult for me to uh, award pay raises to employees. Thank you, um, Mr. Rubens. Is, I think we might have misspoke this a little bit. Isn't isn't the cost of living increase because Mr. Uh, Maltby's employment contract contains a paragraph that says if other members of the of the uh, employees uh, get a raise, he is entitled to the same uh, same amount. It's not an automatic uh, three percent cost of living, is, is it? I believe it just has to do with the tying of the other contracts. Isn't that true? That's correct. It, okay. It's okay. if the management group receives right. a cost of living adjustment, then the city manager right. get, receives the nothing, same. He, it would not be an automatic. Just he would he, if if there was no increase based on cost of living for management group, he would not get right. an increase. Right. Sure everybody understands. No, I, I, okay. I, I understand, but it's automatic down the line. No, I understand. So I just want to make sure that it's understood from the line. outside that it's not an automatic uh, uh, whatever happens. So, all right. So we have uh, uh, yes. Just a brief comment. Um, uh, and, uh, all. I have to be careful about what I say because the negotiations in, in, are in closed session. That's right. Um, I will say that personally, um, I don't view any of the salary increase discussions that I've been involved in as something that I do automatically. Um, I do them based on situations and data and information and competitive environment. So uh, that may just be me, but that's how I look at it. Okay. All right. So uh, is there a motion on the floor? Is, all right, it was, I apologize. Must be getting late. See, it's after 9 o'clock. Okay. We have yeah, a motion. No, not 10.30. All right, so it moved and seconded. Any further discussion or comments? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Olbert? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. And Mayor Grisilli? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, council members, reports on subcommittees, regional boards, commissions, and committees? Any comments? Mr. Grocott? Uh, not anything to do with committees, but just with businesses downtown on Laurel Street unhappy about uh, diseased trees that are uh, making the sidewalks sticky, cars that park sticky. Um, if we could get something done to uh, address that problem, 
there would be a lot of business owners downtown who would be very happy about it. Is that Park and Rec, um, Ms. No, Peterson? It's, it's public or is works. that Public Works? Stephen, you're just, just piling on you. He's it's, writing notes. As I thank you, Stephen. So. Perhaps we can look into that. Uh, Mr. Olbert. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I, I had an uh, item I wanted to bring up for council consideration to see if it's something a council uh, wants to consider putting on the agenda. Uh, I learned the other week that um, a bunch of uh, uh, of the nonprofit groups, uh, non-religious nonprofit groups in San Carlos, who have used Mahaney Hall over the years uh, for various services like uh, Lions and whatnot, and various programs, um, uh, they are doing a fundraiser to help do some sprucing up for the place. Um, I was surprised to learn that apparently the church that runs that tends to let these groups use it for free. Um, so but it gets run down, and there's there's sort of no income stream coming into it. Um, and so my idea was to see if the council would be willing to consider um, uh, uh, making some modest contribution towards this fundraising effort um, to help improve what is essentially a community resource. Now it is a community resource that's also part of a religious uh, organization, So, but it is a community hall there. So I wanted to bring that up to see if there was any interest in having the matter come before us and learn more about what we could or couldn't do and then perhaps uh, make a contribution or not. Sounds like a good idea to me. Be happy to have it on the dice as well. Right. I, uh, I'm not necessarily agree in agreement, but I, I did make a donation individually, so <laughs> to that uh, cause, because I won't be able to be there that evening when it's going to be, ha when they're going to have a fundraiser, but that's fine. We've got three people, so perhaps we can look at that, Ms. Peterson, and figure out a, a time in the next, either the next meeting or the next couple of meetings to throw that on there, uh, the agenda. I just have one question. Are, are, we're not violating any uh, separation between church and state by well, well, that's contributing one of the things to... We'll, that's one of the things we'll be looking at yeah. to, to right. see how, um, um, if that's the council's direction, how we can structure it to, to not to okay. comply. Okay. If we decide to even go through with it. Uh, Mr. Grocott? Are you going to mention uh, the event you went to and gave a proclamation? Oh, yes. Because I was going to mention something. Okay, if, yeah, thank uh, you. I'll follow um, up on you. No, I appreciate it. Um, we had a, uh, an event last uh, week ago Saturday, uh, uh, a proclamation for uh, St. Charles Church uh, is 90 years old. It was 90 years old in September 1st. Wow. I believe it's the oldest uh, church in, uh, religious church in, in the city. And uh, they had a, I had an outdoor mass sort of recreating what it was like 90 years ago. Uh, and then they had a nice reception where I uh, gave them a proclamation from, uh, from the city of San Carlos and Mr. Grocott uh, unfortunately wasn't feeling well, but we also have a coin that we, uh, uh, he indicated we were gonna give to them also, so from the city coin. So. Which, which was done and just something that uh, came about from the research that was pretty interesting is uh, the city of San Carlos was incorporated in 1925 mm -hmm. and uh, there were a number of Catholic families in San Carlos at the time, of course, and three years later is when uh, the the uh, Archbishop, I guess, from San Francisco authorized there to be a congregation, a church established in San Carlos just mm -hmm. three years later. And, ju and just to make sure that set the record straight, I was not part of that group in 1928. <laughs> but, so, but you were mayor. <laughs> but I was mayor, right, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Um, okay, staff comments or city administrative uh, business? Just a couple of reminders. We have the public safety fair coming up this Sunday. It'll be at the same time as the farmer's market. They'll be fun for all people of all ages. We'll have a bounce house and representatives from our fire and police departments as well as public works. And we'll also be issuing a spotlight newsletter this month um, on public safety and emergency preparedness, recognizing that it's National Preparedness Month. And that is all. Okay, is that all we have? All right, anything else? If not, uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you.